Uh, please don't see it. Walk around. Tell the nearest person what your spiritual gift is or your natural ability and how you have used it to serve 3 p.m. service. Please stand, all of us. Please stand. Somebody closest to you, share with them what your spiritual gift is. Uh, you may not be sure it's a spiritual gift. Let me, let me call it an, any natural ability. Just share with them, one or two people, how you have used it to serve 3 p.m. service. I will randomly pick on a few to just come and share with us. Okay. Uh, don't stand alone. Walk to somebody. Walk to somebody. Share with them your spiritual gift and how you are using it currently to serve a 3 p.m. service. Uh, okay, just go ahead. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I want to hear some noise of conversations happening of how you are using your spiritual gift to serve the Church of Christ, particularly 3 p.m. service. Uh, if you are a visitor where you go to church, how you're using your gift. Okay, one more minute. Just uh, summarize, summarize how you are being a blessing to, uh, to the body of Christ, particularly 3 p.m. service. All right, I'm going to, all right, all right, you should be concluding now. Uh, the lady in red, extreme end, that side, please come. Uh, hello, clap for her as she comes to share with us. Uh, how you are. Uh, and it's okay not to know your spiritual gift. It is, it is okay. Uh, it is okay to say, I am planning to start uh, being a blessing to this service. It is okay to say, I haven't considered it yet, but uh, I am work in progress. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. This is really spotting someone. <laughs> It's my very first time to come for the three o'clock service, and I, <laughs> and I was hidden in the corner because I knew I just needed a, a, some refreshing and in quietness alone. <laughs> but anyway, my spiritual gift, I think I have the teaching, uh, the teaching gift, yes. <clears throat> yes, um, I'm using it. I teach, I facilitate some... Uh, prayer school topic, and I also preach the gospel in churches where I'm invited. Mm -hmm. right. She's a teacher of the gospel, so she goes on teaching. Please sit. Uh, the rest of you will meet next Sunday. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to us through this passage in clarity and in simplicity, especially for us to know the call of the church to be united, even when we are diverse in gifting and ability that you may build us up into the body that glorifies you in Jesus' name. Our topic for reflection this afternoon is unity and diversity to build up the body of Christ. And we are continuing in a series of the Ephesians chapter 4. We are at Ephesians chapter 4 and I'm going to be reflecting particularly from uh, the reading that we had, verse 1, all the way to verse 16. I pray for grace uh, to really uh, do justice to this passage, and if not, to at least do 90% uh, of what God would have desired for me to do uh, from this passage. Unity and diversity to build up the body of Christ. Now, we've been studying and uh, learning so many things that Paul is teaching the Gentiles, the church at Ephesus, uh, the people that initially were not known as the people of God. We know that God has blessed each one of us, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, all of us that believe God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And Paul has taught that, that to us. He has said a prayer that we may know God in our 
Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 15 all the way to 23, we have been made alive by the grace of God. It's the grace of Christ that we all have been called to belong uh, to God. And by the cross, he has broken, he has crushed the walls of hostility, the barriers that separated the Jews and Gentiles, Christ has, Christ has dealt with them on the cross. And so the dividing walls are no longer there. We are one, we are the body of Christ. And of course, he speaks of the mystery of Christ in chapter 3, uh, the secret that was not known to the world that Christ has made known that we all, as long as we believe in Jesus, have been made sons and daughters of God. And so, for our passage this afternoon, I want us to talk about three things. And the first is our eagerness to preserve the unity, our eagerness to maintain the unity within the body of Jesus Christ. And so the first thing that I want to address from the passage that was read to us is that we are expected to be eager, to be diligent in working out and preserving the unity that Jesus Christ has given us, that Christ has created for us. And I want to say right from the beginning that it is not so common to be eager to maintain unity in the church. It is not one of those things that uh, you expect to find in, in church that we are working so hard that we are united. It is sad that even when we force congregations, even when we force you believers to do it, we do the bare minimum. Even when we say, can you say, say hello to your neighbor, ask something from them. You go there dragging your feet and uh, just say hello, and you end it at that. You never go. You do the bare minimum. When we say, come on, we are going to celebrate all birthdays in the month, and so we ask you to come, invite somebody who was born in February, so that as we end the month, we celebrate together, we want to be united. Even then, you will call somebody who was born in February when there is an extra pushing, please. And even when you do it, you just send an SMS. You can't call, you can't even visit to say, please come. You do the bare minimum. It is not something we are eager to do. And so Paul exhorts us today, this afternoon, to be eager to work towards maintaining the unity. And he says in verse 1 that it begins with our calling. Let's read verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It begins with our calling. And of course, we cannot miss it that Paul begins by mentioning again, he has mentioned this before, that he is a prisoner for the Lord. He reminds us in a way of his commitment to this unity that he's talking about in this passage, that he has been able to go to prison for the sake of this unity. He is that obedient to Jesus Christ, that is willing to go to prison for the sake of the call upon his life. And so he says, I urge you. This word is not a begging word. He's not begging. He is charging them. I urge you, I charge you. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And so maybe the question now is, what is that calling? We know that as a church, we have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. Not only that, we have also been called to belong to a local church. That scriptures challenge us to belong to a local church, to belong to a body of believers where we can live out our faith, where we are able to forgive one another, to love one another, to bear with one another. A, 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 an environment where this that we profess is able to be made practical. And so that's the calling is talking about. It is a twofold calling. Called to belong to Jesus Christ, but also to belong to one another. And so he says, walk according to the call that you have received. 
upon your life. The worth of work is not just to be randomly taken or to be randomly accepted. The worthy work has some core traits that he puts clear in verse 2. Let's read verse 2 together. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. There are four things that he points out in verse 2 that are so core if we are going to walk a worthy walk. That are so core if unity is going to be realized. If we are to be eager to maintain the unity in the body of Christ, there are four things that we cannot miss. And first, he talks about humility. Everybody say humility. Say it again, humility. It's the quality we need in the body of Christ when others particularly disagree with us. That sometimes not everybody is going to agree with us. Sometimes people are going to disagree with us and the only way unity is going to progress, the only way we can maintain unity is if we walk in humility. And so he points out humility. The second thing, he points out gentleness. The quality we need when we know others are wrong and they need correction. Gentleness. You are sure that the pastor is wrong. You are sure that the service leader is wrong. They need to be corrected in this matter. Gentleness is the quality, is the trait within the body of Christ that we must activate when others do wrong and there is need for them to be corrected. Praise the name of the Lord. And so Paul is aware that there is urgency. We need to be united. We should be eager in maintaining the unity. But for this to be possible, we have to be humble. We have to be gentle. Thirdly, patience. Everybody say patience. There is somebody in this congregation called patience. It's the quality we need when they fail. When they fail to our attempts to guide them. Sometimes you want to guide people, but your attempts to guide them fails or they fail to do that that you are asking them to do. And Paul says, rather than being mad at them, you have to be patient with them. There are not many people who are called to be patient. We are all called to be patient, but not many people are gifted that way. Uh, we are quick to give up. We are quick to say, well, I am not your creator. You have a God. He will deal with you. I will move on. God knows I've done my best. Patience. In order for us to maintain unity in the body of Christ, you have to be patient with the brethren and the sistren. You have to be patient. It's the quality we need. So, humility, gentleness, patience, and finally, in this verse 2, the core trait for us to maintain, to be eager in maintaining unity, he says, bearing with one another in love. Bearing with one another in love. This is the quality we need when others sin against us and unity is greatly endangered. When somebody sins against you, when somebody does something you know offends you, sometimes it is deliberate, sometimes it is not deliberate, they are not even aware that they are sinning against you. And so Paul says, for unity to continue in the body of Christ, we have to bear with one another in love. Praise the name of the Lord. And so when you examine these traits, you obviously see that they are pointing us to nobody else except Jesus Christ himself. So the call for us to maintain unity in the body of Christ is a call for us to be like Jesus Christ. No wonder he invites us in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. He continues, Paul says in Colossians, put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. Bearing with one 
another. So we cannot run away from the character of Jesus Christ. But I will say to us, to be honest, it is hard. Do we agree that it is hard? When somebody keeps so hurting you and uh, you bear, and then you bear and you bear and you say, ah, ah, no, 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 no. I think I am nange ndi muntu. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you, but the call is keep on doing good without getting tired. It is hard because we are weak and sinful. Our brothers and sisters too are weak and sinful. So the easier thing for us to do is to keep safe distance. It's easier for us to put up barriers. It's easier for us to make sure that we, we are not hurt. We don't reveal the true, the true selves. We don't, we don't show people who we truly are. So what we do is to cover up either with a smile. and uh, So rather than bearing with one another, you just say, I will pretend. Rather than being patient, you just live in pretense so that you are not hurt. You don't even, you, what you do, you, you sense, you discern that this environment is likely going to hurt me. So let me just keep a distance from it. Paul says, in order for us to keep with eagerness the unity of the body, we should be humble, we should be patient, we should bear with one another, and there is a possibility of us doing these things as just an act of righteousness without involving our hearts. And that is why he adds the phrase that we should do it in love. Verse 3 particularly has the word eager, diligent, to be quick, to maintain, to guard. We are not creating the unity. The unity has already been given to us by Jesus Christ. But we are called to guard, to maintain the unity. It is our duty. We need to realize that we don't create this unity. However, we have been called to guard the unity. We cannot see things going on in such a manner that the unity in the body of Christ is being disintegrated and we simply look on and say, well, everybody for themselves and God for us all. That is not the attitude of Paul in this passage. In chapter 2, verse 22, we read, In him you also are being built up together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So we can be different from each other, that is okay, but we have been brought into this unity through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. It's possible for us to be different. It's possible for some people to be talkative and others quiet. It's possible for other people to be difficult to love. But all of us that confess Jesus Christ have been called into, have been brought into unity through the one spirit, the spirit of the living God. And in verse 3 again, he adds, in the bond of peace, that when Christ died, we read earlier in the earlier series, he brought peace by reconciling everybody to the Father. Again, the peace we don't create it. Jesus has given us the peace. It's ours to simply maintain the peace that he has given to us. And so the question is, but why? Why all this talk about unity? Why is it so important? Verse 4 to 6, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The church must be one because God is one. And so, we cannot be a divided church and then we claim to be the church of God. If we truly are the church of God, the church of Christ, then we ought to be eager to maintain the unity in the body of Christ. Amen. Eagerness 
to maintain the unity. How committed are you to keeping the body of Christ united? What are you doing actively to ensure that 3 p.m. service, we are a body? We are the body of Christ. We are children of God together. We belong to one another. What are you doing actively? What special gifts has God given you that you are using to benefit 3 p.m., particularly maintain, maintaining the unity of the body of Christ? But the second thing, besides maintaining the unity and being eager to maintain it, that I want to say from this passage is that the unity of the church should not be undermined by the diversity of gifts Christ has given to us and vice versa. The unity of the church should not be undermined by the diversity of gifts Christ has given to us and vice versa. So the unity should not be undermined by the gifts, but also the gifts should not undermine the unity that Christ has given to us. I could ask, why do you come to church? Why do you attend 3 p.m. service or whichever service that you attend? Is it because you are part of the crowd? Your friends told you you're going to 3 p.m. service and you thought, let me come along. Are you coming because maybe you were pushed? Or for you it's just a habit? Every Sunday you're expected to be at church? Or simply to feel good or to receive? In this passage, one of the things that we see coming out very clearly is that God expects committed participation in church. That committed participation in Christ's church is the plan for every believer. Participation in the church is not for a few individuals. And as a pastor, I will tell you, this is the thing I have faced so many times, so many years. That you will have a full congregation, a full church, including the overflow tents, but you struggle to find somebody that is going to serve with you at a prayer meeting. Why? Because many people have resigned, have reduced themselves to simply being spectators in the body of Christ. I want to say to us this afternoon, it might come as a disappointment, there is no space for spectators in the body of Christ. Hello? There is no space for spectators. We all should participate in building up the body of Christ. And that's the point for Christ equipping us to participate in his church. We ought to be equipped for the work of ministry and reach God's ultimate goal. Read verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Let me go slow on that verse. But grace was given to each one of us. Does it say here that grace was given to some of us? It says grace is given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so here, Paul turns from the unity that he has been talking about in the beginning verses, and so he turns to our diversity. He turns to the fact that we are different, we have different abilities, we have different gifts, and there is a way it sounds unfair in this passage when we read that we have been gifted differently according to everyone's measure of grace. And so there is a way it appears like there is favoritism in giving these abilities because they are given randomly. But what Paul is really saying in this passage is that Christ makes us unique based on his grace. So it is not favoritism. It is that we are unique according to the grace that Christ gives us. So people are diverse but it is the same grace that has given us that diversity. Praise the name of the Lord. And in verse 11, he continues to list down the various uh, gifts, at least for this passage. I will read verse 11. It says, 
And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. And I also must say that this is not the entire list. There is no passage in the New Testament that gives the whole list of spiritual gifts. The different passages give a few gifts, but when you put together the passages, then you realize that there are so many gifts that have been poured out to the body of Christ. But this verse, particularly this one, specifies only a few. And so, but for now, the emphasis for Paul is that they are gifts of grace that have been given by Christ himself. And there are people who have said, you see, uh, there are spiritual gifts, there are also talents, and uh, there's that conversation, that argument, uh, natural abilities. So, you know, natural abilities and talents are not exactly given really as spiritual gifts. And, you know, I have resolved that conversation by saying, whether it is a spiritual gift or a natural ability, all these have been given by grace. Amen? Every ability, listen, there is what we call special revelation that is given for believers, those of you that have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that is special revelation, but there is also general revelation. That there can be somebody who has no idea who God is, they do not worship God, but God out of his special revelation, out of his special grace has extended mercy for them to do certain things. For example, doctors. God gives them wisdom out of his grace, ability to be doctors. You can talk about talents, you can talk about every ability that somebody has. It has been given graciously by God. And so Paul Qualifies. Paul wants us to know that all these abilities, all these gifts that Christ has poured out, first of all, they are gifts, and this implies we don't create them. It implies we don't earn them. We don't deserve them. And this is where I battle with people who think I am a preacher because I have fasted many days. It is because you have been called that you have the works that you are doing. It is not the works that make you the kind of person that you are. Praise the name of the Lord. These are gifts. They have been given graciously by God himself. And so we receive them only by his grace. An amazing Paul picks up an Old Testament passage in verse 8 when he says, therefore it says when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. This quote is a summary of what we read in Psalm 68. In Psalm 68, there is a prediction of how Jesus, the one who ascended on high, gave gifts to to different people, to his people, and he led a host of captives. The meaning really is that he conquered sin and death and Satan in order to save us, and his ascension, his ascending on high has made him our sovereign Lord. And that sovereignty makes him worthy to give any measure of gift according to how he sees it fit. So Paul is qualifying the fact that Christ has given us these abilities and we must not question because the one who has given is high above. He is the one who ascended above everything else. So you even have no authority to ask, why is so and so gifted this way and yet me I don't have this gifting? Because the one who is far above has decided it that way. And of course, Paul to the Romans would say, you are clay and is the potter. How many times have you seen the clay asking the potter, why did you make me into this shape? So that's the point he's making. That the one who ascended on high is the one that has determined all these gifts. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Hallelujah. And so, discovering and using our gifts is accepting his sovereign will, but also his grace upon our lives. Paul says something more in verse 9 and 10. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might feel all things. So in one sense, he is telling us that Jesus has the right to give us gifts because he has ascended far above all the heavens and fills all things. But in another sense, Paul is telling us in a way that Jesus sets us an example that he first descended to the lower regions of the earth. It implies Christ's humility. That the one who is that high was able to come down to the earth, descended to the lower regions of the earth. That the one who gives all those gifts is humble enough to get that law. And so, in a way, Paul wants the believers to emulate the example of Jesus Christ that those who receive the gifts should be humble now that even the giver of the gifts was humble enough to descend to the lower regions of the earth. Praise the name of the Lord. It's a call for us to be humble. We can see that Christ humbled himself even when he had all those abilities. Verse 11 again, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. This is the, the list of gifts that Christ gives his church in this passage. And I want to be clear on this, that these are not church positions. Say after me, these are not church positions. Oh, come on, say it again. These are not church positions. Friends, <laughs> these are not church positions, but people whom Christ has gifted. These are people that Christ has gifted. The list in verse 11 reflects gifts that are given with greater measure or in greater measure. In chapter 2 of the same Ephesians, verse 20, let me read there. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. We read that these gifts seem to be given a higher measure. Chapter 2, verse 20. Listen to what it says. That built on the foundation of the apostles, maybe I can start from verse 19. So then you are, not, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The church built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Chapter 3, verse 5, he says something like this, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So these gifts are not to be taken for granted because they are gifts that are given with a higher measure of grace. Praise the name of the Lord. Again to emphasize not positions but gifts Christ has given to his people. So Paul mentions apostles and prophets as foundational to the church. As foundational. And what do these gifts mean? The apostles, of course, are people who go into places where Christ is not known and get churches started there. Those are the apostles. And we read this from Romans chapter 15, verse 20, when Paul is giving his own example of going to places where there was no the church of Christ and building the church there and evangelizing and pioneering places there for the sake of the gospel. We read about the prophets in this passage, the people that have been empowered by the Spirit of God for building up, for encouragement and consolation of God's people. And when we read Paul's later 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, Paul speaks into that, that the prophets are largely called to exhort, to encourage, to lift up, to build the body of Christ. The evangelists, the people who share the gospel with unbelievers and bring new people into the church. And of course, the shepherds, those that watch over the flock of Christ, those that minister to and guide people in the right way, setting a good example, according to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 and 3. And finally, he mentions teachers, those who are to teach the people of God with sound doctrine. An emphasis he gives to 1 first, uh, first, Titus, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, and uh, chapter 4, verse 6, chapter 6, verse 3. So he emphasizes all this, and he says for the church to function, all these people must be in play. Now listen, some people may have more than one gift, but it is clear that not one person has all the gifts. And no church is going to thrive by the gift of just one person. But I want you to scan around. In a radius of two kilometers, you'll find about 50 churches, and all the 50 churches are built on just one gift. The emphasis is on just one gift, something that is not biblical, something that is sad, because if we do not allow all the gifts to thrive, we are going to be endangered and will not grow according to the will of God. So some people may be strong in one gift, others may have overlapping gifts, a combination of them, but Paul's point here is that these people are such a great gift to the church of Christ. They are a team. And not just to limit it to these gifts, all the other spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the New Testament and through the scriptures are to function together as a team. Church is not a one-man show. I remember days when uh, I used to do overnights. And I would be the praise and worship leader, I would be the intercessor, I would be the preacher, I would have arrived earlier to arrange the chairs. And uh, ah, by morning, I am an exhausted person. And I'm there all happy. Ah, man, we are here suffering for Christ. Man, <laughs> you're not suffering for Christ. <laughs> you are suffering for ignorance. There are other people that you have to bring on board so that you serve the body of Christ as a team. Church is not a one-man show. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. God calls us to work together. And these ones especially that have been called in on these foundational gifts have to emulate the dissension of Jesus Christ. His humility most of all. The purpose of all these these gifts that Christ has given, we read it in verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. The gifts that Christ gives us are not to promote ourselves. They are not for our own glory, but to equip his holy people. And so, being called as a pastor it's not for me to come here and do everything as you guys are watching. My call, primarily as a pastor, is that I may equip you, empower you, so you will go and minister to God's people. Amen? And so, if the pastor is the one doing everything, it's the pastor on Sunday at the pulpit, it's the pastor on the streets in street evangelism, it's the pastor on Sunday 26th that is serving the cup of tea, it's the pastor, there is something wrong. The role of these gifts is so that it says to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, to equip the saints. 
And so the call is as you accumulate this information, as God teaches you by his spirit, as you realize these things, the soul searching question is what are you going to do about them? Because they are not for you to go around boasting. Ah, man, we have prayed. Ah. Do you know January, February, and March, we covered the entire book of Ephesians. How many books have you covered, for example? Me, I have finished Ephesians. The year is not yet even in the middle, but Ephesians is down. I'm waiting for the next. It's not for you to just feel good accumulating knowledge. It's that you would go out and minister. Amen? That is the role of the gifts that Christ gives. It's not to promote ourselves but to equip the saints, to equip God's holy people. And the word equip is to, implies training and discipline so that people can be more effective. For you to be effective, for you to be efficient, you have to be equipped for the work of ministry. And that is the will of God, to help, to serve. The last part of verse 12 says, for building up the body of Christ it's to emphasize the unity. We are a body building up the body. We are not individuals. We are a body. It emphasizes our diversity because a body, whereas it is one, it has many parts. So equipping the body means we are equipping all the parts of this body. Just as the body has many parts, so the church has people with various gifts. And the body needs all the gifts, all the parts. No part can say I am more important than the other. But it also gets dangerous when you have one part of the body growing and the other part is stunted. Somebody recently asked me, but Reverend, what's this whole thing of, uh, I've been asking that in all the cells, uh, we do the same content, so we discuss the same stuff, so that we are able to grow together. That's the point, that a body grows together. Because some, somebody was saying, but you see, for us, we might be thinking, in our context, we should be growing in this other grace. It will not help the body to be grown so big. You have an adult body, and yet the feet are baby feet. Can you imagine that? That the rest of the body is uh, 30 years, but the feet this body is carrying are fit for, you saw the baby is here. There is a problem. There is a problem. If the rest of the body is a mature body and the head is for a baby, it is a problem. That can't be a body. And that is why we have to be eager in maintaining the unity while embracing our diversity because the diversity then facilitates the united body's growth. If you suffocate one, you have a problem on the other. Praise the name of the Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit will make you uncomfortable where you are and you will surely style up. Amen. That you'll surely leave your comfort zone and be eager about the unity of the body, but you'll also be eager to discover your spiritual gift, to discover some of you already know your abilities, but to simply put that to use, to use within the body of Christ. Hallelujah. The point is building up the body of Christ. That is our goal. And so we need to ask God to change our mindset from trying to get something from church to trying to give something to church. I pray that you'll graduate from just coming to church to receive and you come to church to give. Amen. Each time you come to church, you're asking what, what is in it for me? What is there for me? And when they preach a sermon that you listen to from somebody else, you're thinking, ah, Enosande, Ensaze. You know I had that sermon. Rather than thinking about receiving and receiving and receiving and consuming, have you thought about giving and giving and giving and giving? That's our call. 
I pray indeed that we'll discover our different abilities, that we are able. I pray that you will ask God to show you what you can do in 3 p.m. What you will do in the body of Christ. Maybe it's not possible in 3 p.m. It should be possible elsewhere. Maybe where you work, in that office, that you receive grace. God will challenge you. God will show you the one thing that you can do in that place. Number three and last, the reason for all ministry is growing up into Christ. Developing maturity. Growing into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Where is all this leading? Eagerness to be united. Eagerness to maintain the diversity and to grow the body. Not compromising on the unity, not compromising on the gifts in the church. What's the reason for all this? Verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Our goal in ministry is building up one another's faith in the knowledge of Christ so that we'll grow into the full measure of Christ. We'll grow into the likeness of Christ. So what's the point of all these gifts? That we may all grow. Not that our church will be more popular than other churches, but that individual attendees and members and participants of that church, of that congregation, will grow more and more into likeness, the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's the reason for all ministry. That's the reason Paul is laboring to explain to the church at Ephesus. It's not personal maturity, whereas that is very important. It is also to consider that we are a body, unified, mature, the mature church of Christ. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And so, as we grow into the likeness of Christ, as we mature, the consequence is that we will no longer be children tossed about by every wind of teaching. And I want to speak to you frankly, it's the, there is an alternative for whoever chooses not to grow. And the alternative is also in this passage, and you just have to turn this verse so for you, you'll be tossed by every teaching that is coming up in town. Oh, come on. What did you say? There is a what? Where? I am, when do they meet? And there you go. So as you're there, you realize there's something else. Uh, this one is breakfast. It is in the morning. And, and there you go. You'll be tossed up and about. I will tell you, you'll be tossed. Let me tell you, there is no perfect church. Because all churches are constituted by sinners that are simply forgiven by grace. And where sinners are, they hurt themselves. Did you hear me? Oh, yeah. So what we are here to do is to be humble, is to bear with one another, is to be patient with one another as we grow up into the likeness of Christ with the hope that by the time Christ comes, we shall be like him. So I want to encourage you to purpose to grow. Verse 15, rather, how to avoid this? Verse 15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Sometimes the truth is harsh, so we all need to be speaking this truth in love. Why into Christ? Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. 
But I want you to take note of that phrase, when each part is working properly. So which means if there are parts that are not working properly, there is a problem in the body. There is a problem in the body. I mean, these things work even for, you know, our usual everyday things, secular things. For example, yesterday I could tell that because Saka was not physically fit properly in the last 15 minutes, there was a problem in Arsenal's attacks. And so if that principle works for football, how much more for spiritual things? If there is, I mean, I want you to, to get injured and, you know, you have dislocated one of your joints and walk properly. It's impossible. There is a problem. So you can't expect it to be different for the body of Christ. If there is a part that is out of joint, if the ashes are not positioned in the way they should be positioned, then there is going to be disorganization in seating. You'll find people sitting where, you know, the president should sit. Hello, in this 3 p.m., we don't have where the president sits. <laughs> this is your father's house. You can sit anywhere. But the point is, if the teacher is not teaching, then the people are not learning. And if they are not learning, then they are not doing what Christ has called them to do. There is a problem when one part of the body is not fully functional. And so that is why we have to be eager and work at it with Christ's sovereignty above everything else. So, such contacts, joints, body parts are important in supporting one another. We have been called to be eager to maintain the unity of the body of Christ. However, we are cautioned that the unity should not compromise the diversity but also the diversity should not compromise the unity. And thirdly, the whole point of all this is that we may grow up into Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word this afternoon, challenging us, reminding us that though we are many, we are one body. And this body, you have gifted us differently. According to your grace, we are unique. And you call us to each be functioning so that the body is functional. And as the body is functional, you will be glorified in the whole earth. We thank you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.